This next series of tutorials will cover various techniques for working with geographical datasets. How to read GIS data, visualize hard and soft conditions, bring in data from Excel, and work with web-based data sources like Yelp, Google, and WalkScore. This first video will cover the basics of bringing in a GIS dataset and using it to construct a 3D city model. So before we get started on this tutorial, there is something we need to do. We need to uh, grab some additional plugins. Uh, we saw in a previous tutorial how to install plugins, but I will go over it again. Um, in the 2.x GIS and Grasshopper folder, there is a zip file called plugins. And a critical step, this is something that trips up a lot of people when they're installing third-party plugins, um, is to take the zip file and go to properties and make sure you hit this unblock button and hit apply. It's a good idea to do this on the zip file. You can also do it on all of the individual files after you've unzipped. But if you do it on the zip file, you only have to do it once. So go ahead and use either the system unzip utility or 7-zip or something like that to extract all of that data to a folder. And there are going to be two subfolders in there, uh, one called libraries. And all of this stuff you can copy and then bring over to your C users, username, app data, roaming, grasshopper folder. There's also a shortcut to get here if you do backslash percent app data slash grasshopper. Uh, then you can go to the libraries folder and paste all of that content. If there are any versions of these plugins that you already have, uh, you can go ahead and replace them. Um, but you should now see Heron and Human and Metahopper show up in there. And then go back up a level and go to user objects. And we're going to go up one here to, to grab all of these Excel user objects, which are from a plugin called Bumblebee by David Mance, which we're going to use to interact with Excel. So with all of those installed, go ahead and fire up Rhino. And with Rhino launched, we want to make sure we have a document in feet. So just to be safe, you can type units in the command line and go make sure that your model units are in feet. And we're going to do something even before we start Grasshopper, which is going to tell this Rhino document where it exists in the world. A lot of the plugins we're going to be relying on to do GIS stuff rely on a property of the Rhino document called the Earth Anchor Point. And so for these purposes, we're going to need to figure out the latitude and longitude of a particular location that we want to work with. So the sort of cheap way that I tend to do this is just to go to Google Maps and find one. So if we go, I'm going to just search for Columbia University to use as our Earth anchor point, uh, go to Maps. And once you've got your map up, uh, one of the things you may need to do is actually X out of the search query. And then the URL shows you latitude and longitude. So this is sort of a quick way to do a lat long lookup that I often use. So I'm going to copy this value, return to Rhino use the earth anchor point command, click latitude, paste my value, return to the browser, select my longitude, and make sure you don't get this comma 17z. That's actually a zoom value that Google uses to tell you how far in you're zoomed. Um, and then I'm going to paste my longitude and then hit enter. And then it wants a point in the world or in your model that corresponds to that physical location in the world. And I usually just use the origin. So hit enter, hit enter, hit enter to accept all of those defaults until you just see command again. And we've now, even though it doesn't look like anything has changed, we've now configured this Rhino file to have a physical location in space. So with that done, go ahead and fire up Grasshopper. So we're going to start by bringing in an SHP file, which I think you've seen previously in other GIS contexts. So in the folder for this, uh, for this uh, tutorial, there's a data subfolder. And in it is an SHP file uh, that I've processed uh, from a larger one. Um, now, SHP files always have sort of different data fields and things like that. So if you're working with other SHP files, you may need to adjust your workflow in order to accommodate that. Um, but the general process for bringing it in and extracting data from it uh, should be the same. So 
what I like to do usually is I will do a uh, shift right click in order to get the special option to copy as path. It might be somewhere different in the menu, but this is a quick shortcut. That's shift and right click to get copy as path. And what that will do is copy onto the clipboard the full path to that file. So I'm gonna create a text panel and paste, and you'll wanna remove those quotes. And this will give you the full path to that SHP file. Now, I'm also going to go ahead and save this document in the same location as the files we're working with. So I'm going to save this as uh, 2.1 begin. And it's important that this Grasshopper file have a location because we're going to rely on a utility component from MetaHopper called Relative Path. So if you go to the MetaHopper tab, it might look differently up on your display. Uh, go and grab Relative Path. It's the one that looks like this. And when you plug in this absolute path, it will automatically remove any of the absolute information relative to where this Grasshopper file is stored. But what comes out is still the absolute path because most other components in Grasshopper rely on that. Um, but this way, if you were to move your data and your Grasshopper file to some other folder location, this definition would still work. So we've got a path to an SHP file, and we're now going to use a component from uh, Herman. And Herman is, as you can see up here, sort of an incomplete plugin. It's a sort of work in progress that I've been developing on top of and in tandem with the built in components in Heron, which is a GIS tool set developed by Brian Washburn. So Herman extends and expands some of the functionality of Heron. So let's go ahead and grab the parse SHP component. Make sure it's not the one called import SHP, use parse SHP. And before we plug this in, we're going to create a Boolean toggle. I'm just gonna double click and choose toggle, set this to true and plug it in. And this D input is asking whether to disable spatial filtering. The native Heron component requires you to first run it once, set a region inside that region, and then run it again. This way, there will be no filtering. It'll just use the entire SHP file. So go ahead and plug in this SHP uh, path, and this may take a second. And when that's done, we should see a bunch of points, um, and I can highlight this component, uh, right-click the canvas and choose zoom in order to zoom my active viewport, and maybe I'll maximize the top view so we can really see this. So this is bringing in the raw point data for all of the polygons in this shapefile. Um, and so we're going to need to do a little work to turn this into something useful. In addition to those points, we've also got a number of data fields. So if I go back to my params tab and grab a panel and connect this to fields, we'll see the names of all of the data that we have access to. Um, and this is going to be really important as a reference as we start to use the data embedded in this SHP data set. Now, fields is just a single list with all of the names of the fields, and values, if you look at it, is a structured data set with 9,502 branches, um, each of which has 14 items. So for every feature, which you can see is also organized this way, um, we have the associated values for that feature. So the name and the building height and all of that other information. So it's useful to keep track of the index of a given field that you're looking for because that's how we're going to extract data from it. Um, now, this is a little bit of a more esoteric point, but the feature points also have one extra layer of hierarchy in their data tree. So you can see where it says 0, 095010. That first zero just means the entire set of the data. The second one is the features. And then the third one is subcomponents of these features. So uh, in some cases, a feature may have multiple polylines. So we're going to need to figure out how to manipulate this data tree in order to keep our features together. So the first thing we want to do, though, is construct a polyline through these points so that we don't see this kind of mess of little x's. So I'm going to turn off preview for this component. And I'm going to go to the curve tab and spline and grab the polyline component. 
and we'll plug in these feature points, and now we should see something a little bit cleaner. And you can see that in some cases, uh, some polylines have sort of internal polylines that represent like courtyard conditions or other such things. So this data structure, if we return to that lecture about lists, has 9,921 branches. And you can see in general, there's only one sort of sub-branch. Everything goes to zero. But in a few cases, like right here, branch 756 has, there's actually one sub-branch at zero and one sub-branch at one, meaning there are multiple polylines for feature 756. So in order to pop this layer of hierarchy off, we use a list operation called shift paths, which we'll find under the set tab, tree, shift paths, and its default value of negative one should work very well for us in this case. Um, as soon as I plug this in, you'll see that those things get condensed. We lose that hierarchy, and what was a separate branch is now multiple items in the same branch. So that means we've got lists of either one or more polylines present in our data structure. So that's great because it means we can take advantage of the boundary surface component, which we've seen before under surface freeform boundary surfaces, which will take a list of curves and calculate the sort of filled boundary between those curves. And if it, has, if it receives multiple curves and those curves are inside of one another, it will treat the outermost one as sort of the solid edge and then an internal curve as a void or a hole in that boundary. So let's just let this finish thinking. So there we go. Now it's filled in these regions, including any of the sort of voids or holes in our building footprints. So the next thing we want to do is build these up into a sort of three-dimensional extrusion. Um, so for that, we're going to need some more information, um, in particular, the height of the roof of each one of these features. So in order to extract data from our set of values associated with this SHP file, uh, I typically use a list item component from sets list list item. And remember, because this is organized in a data tree, um, if I feed in this whole tree and I specify a single index, like let's use construction year. So I'm going to use a shortcut and just double click the canvas and type three to create a slider with a default value of three and plug this in. Um, this is going to grab the third item or rather the fourth item, the item at index three from every one of these lists, meaning per feature. I just used a, another shortcut where I double click and type a quote mark in order to quickly create a panel, but we can just use this to visualize. This is going to give us the construction year of each one of those features. So that's data that maybe we'll want to use later. So I'll actually hold on to this, pull it off to the side, and then copy and paste it so that we can grab another piece of data, which in this case is going to be the height of the roof. So I can see that's at index 7. So if I set this value to 7, then I should get the height of the roof for every one of those boundaries. And what I want to do is convert that to a z vector, a vector in the z direction that I can use with an extrude component. So I'm going to go into a perspective view so we can see the kind of three-dimensional operation we're about to do. And with this data loaded, I've got my height roof in that list item component. I can use a Z vector, and I'm going to double click and just type Z to quickly create it, or if you want, you can go to the vector tab, and over here on the right under the vector sub tab, use unit Z, it's the same thing, and plug this in. And what I think we'll find is that the component turns red because it failed to convert to a proper number, which probably means, and this is a common thing to happen when you're working with SHP data, is that not all of the data is a proper number. But I think it's OK, because it will still give us a proper vector wherever there is a correct number, and it'll just return a null or sort of an invalid value where that doesn't happen. So let's go ahead and use this to extrude our boundary surfaces. So we're going to go back to the Surface tab and use Extrude over here, which will take either a surface or a curve and an extrusion vector. And we can see that these data trees are the same. They go from 00 to 09501, both of them, which means it's safe to combine them in this component. So I'm going to plug in my extrusion vector. I'm going to plug in my boundary surfaces. And this will probably take a second. 
All right, so that's all done. Um, took about a minute or two on my machine. Um, now, there's one other step we can do here which will help this perform better in the future. I mean, you'll always have to calculate this, but in terms of the display performance, um, I often like to mesh my extrusions. Uh, and so if you double click and type mesh BREP for BREP or boundary representation, um, then you can plug in this extrusion result into B. This will also take one quick second. Um, but then we can turn off preview for everything else. And what I found is that this makes the grasshopper display more responsive. And these meshes are actually more useful to you for display purposes and things like that. Now, there are things you can do with poly surfaces that you can't do with meshes and vice versa. And I won't get into the details of that now, but suffice it to say that for large context models and things like that, meshes are generally a better bet. They're just lighter weight and easier to work with. Um, and for anything that you're working on in great detail, where you might actually need to do some additional modeling, like you know booleaning or other sorts of Rhino operations on top of the geometry, then you'll want to hold on to your poly surfaces. But for the purposes of display, uh, we can just use these meshes. So I'll let this finish. There we go. And what I'm going to do is select all of my other geometry, everything that's not this mesh, and right click the canvas and choose preview disable, or sorry, preview off, so that we're just left with the meshes. And if you compare the speed of like orbiting and moving around the model, you'll find that with just the meshes showing, things will be much faster. So that's a big reason we do this. Uh, so. That concludes this first part of the tutorial. Next, we're going to look at data sets with Excel.